Today's reading will be from Mark, Mark chapter 13, verse 24 to 37. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know, what, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But, that, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's, a, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge even with their assigned task, and tells, that, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we've already heard somebody at the front be very, very enthusiastic about the C word because it's December. It's not too early to talk about it. Although that is a bit of a sliding scale, I would suggest. There are some people that it's never too early for them to talk about Christmas. Other people would prefer not to talk about it at all, to be honest. A friend of mine um, uh, objected so strongly to his normal radio station um, starting talking about Christmas in October that on principle he changed channel and hasn't changed back so far, at least I need to check in with him. As I say, that's a pretty strong objection to someone talking about Christmas too early in his view. If you are more, more at the end of things, though, then the uh, good news of Advent is that this is a season where the Christian church has a slightly different focus than the culture around us. As we count down towards when we remember the coming of Jesus, his first coming, we also, at the same time in Advent, remember his future coming, his second coming, and start to look forward to that together and anticipate it together. Which is why we started December with a pretty sobering reading, I think you'll agree, reading about the end of the world at the start of December, because it's the start of Advent. Uh, when I grew up in the 1980s, um, there was, uh, both from school and in general culture, there was a real kind of tangible fear that nuclear war was not some sort of outside chance, but was a real possibility, the Cold War between the West and the East. And if you've seen the film Oppenheimer uh, in recent days, there is a hugely sobering visualization of what that would look like at the end, as well as, uh, sorry, I'm not, I mustn't go off on a tangent, I found it a really moving and powerful film, uh, particularly when they, they depict the testing of the first nuclear device. And you just think, goodness me. Uh, COP28 is happening at the moment. The focus there is not on the exceptional things that human beings do, but the everyday things that human beings do. And the influence that your life and my life, just by doing everyday things, all of us together, the influence that that is happening on, happening on the planet. And the real tangible concern 
has anyone got any significantly game-changing answers? Or is it all just blah, 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 as someone once said? It's significant, it's serious to think about the big picture of the world, isn't it? Well, Jesus, as he did it, uh, we read it a moment ago, 2,000 years ago, he, he, he gave a word picture. Verse 24, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaking. He, he, he gives that picture, and he, he's talking into the future and saying, there will be an end. However specifically it comes, and if you compare Jesus' word picture to the uh, fears of the 80s, the predictions of the climate change um, possibilities, you think, yeah, that's, either of those could be a factor in seeing Jesus' words come about. The, the point of him saying it, though, isn't to sort of add to the general sense of, gosh. The point of him saying it is to point for where hope is really found in the light of the fact that this world will one day pass away. Verse 31, if you look down to there, he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Which is why we're focusing this morning on the words of Jesus Christ, because that's where we're going to find some sense, some meaning, and some hope that goes beyond our circumstances. It's actually quite a complicated chapter, Mark chapter 13. It's why we're just reading the end part of it. Jesus is weaving together two explanations right through. He starts mainly at the beginning. He's talking about the temple in Jerusalem, which um, the disciples had noticed around them. They were in it at the time, and Jesus predicts when that will be destroyed, which happened in AD 70. And then he goes on to talk about the end of the world, but there's sort of elements of each woven into both parts. His big headline, though, as he thinks about the future, the big headline here is that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming, it's saying. At no point will God lose control of things, whatever happens with the climate, whatever verse 24 and 25 are describing, Time will come to a decisive end at the time that God decides. And the last event in human history, if you look down to verse 26, will be Jesus coming. Jesus is coming. That's his promise. And his second coming will be so different from his first, as we're, the first coming we'll remember in three weeks' time. But the second coming, verse 26, it will be in clouds with great power and glory. The return of the true king, that's what's being pictured here. The return of someone with um, earth-changing authority to make things right at last. He will come back as the one truly in charge and he will make everything new. We tend to think of Jesus usually as, well, he, he, he's back there in history, isn't he? He's, he's back in history. Yeah, yeah, we read about him in the Bible. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's, he's a figure of history. But Jesus is coming. Jesus is the man and God that you and I and everyone will one day stand before and give an account of our lives, how we've lived in this world. That's who Jesus is. He's not stuck back there in history. He came in history once but he is coming, and he lies ahead of you and me in the future. We will stand before him one day. It'll be a little bit like the end of that um, film, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. It's a sort of cheesy kind of movie that might get repeated at Christmas. Uh, if you're younger, you almost certainly won't have seen it. If you're like me, you'll have probably seen it more than once. At the end of the movie, you, you'll know the story anyway of Robin Hood, won't you? At the end of the movie, there's a, a wedding scene in the forest. And it's celebrating the, the, the marriage. And, and then all of a sudden, people start dropping down on one knee. Because into the middle of the clearing rides King Richard the Lionheart, returned from lands afar. And throughout the Robin Hood story, 
The king is far away in a different country. Some people believe he's never going to return, and so they rebel against him, people like the sheriff of Nottingham. They rebel and they live as they want. They live as if he's not the king anymore. There'll be no consequences for me doing whatever I've pleased. Other people, though, like the band of um, merry men and women in the forest, they live loyally to King Richard. They know he's coming back, and so they live loyally to him. Do you see how that's a bit of a picture? What does King Richard do in the story when he gets back? He sorts things out because he is still the rightful king. He's been away, but once he's back, those who've rejected him, um, they get rejected. The people who've served him whilst he was away, well, they're included and they're given responsibility. In that sort of a way, Jesus is coming. He's in a far country right now, but he is the true king and he will return in all his glory. People will mock if you ever talk to people about this. They'll say, oh, come on, you don't believe that, do you? It's been 2,000 years. He's not coming back. But think for a moment, if in the first half of Mark chapter 14, Jesus, 40 years in advance, correctly predicted the events around the uh, destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which would come later from the Romans in AD 70. Forty years in advance, he predicted that correctly. It's written down. Well, how about the second half of the chapter? Even if it's 4,000 years in advance, doesn't that give us confidence in what we read when Jesus starts talking about the end of the world? He is coming. He levels with us in verse 32 that actually only, only God the Father knows exactly when, only God the Father knows the way, so don't listen to some crazy cult or YouTube channel that um, someone comes along and says, oh yes, I can tell you the date and here are the calculations. No, don't listen to that. We don't know when Jesus is coming exactly, but we do know that he is definitely coming. As king, he'll come back, he'll rule, and he will sort things out. He'll gather his loyal people, and verse 27 gives a picture of that, the angels going to the four winds, and he'll judge his enemies. Jesus is coming. He's the future. In fact, if you think about it, Jesus coming back one day is the only certainty in your future and in mine. We, we may have a diary or a calendar full of plans for the next month, probably most of us do, whether we want it or not, and we might have full of plans for the next year. But none of us knows what tomorrow will bring, this afternoon even. We can't even trust the ground under our feet because heaven and earth will pass away. But we can trust whatever Jesus says. His words will never pass away. That is certain. So, do I, do you, do we, live accordingly if it's certain that Jesus is coming well we need to be ready don't we verse 33 be on guard be alert verse 37 what I say to you I say to everyone watch we want to be ready when we hear of gosh wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in various places all the things that have been happening actually for 2,000 years we're reminded not only of the need to show compassion and the desire to pray, but actually all of these things, all of these grindings and groanings of planet Earth and of human beings on planet Earth, all of them actually are reminders that Jesus has promised that he will come and sort it out. And so we want to be ready for his return. Day or night is the picture here. Uh, Jesus talks about a, a man, a wealthy person, uh, going away and leaving the servants in charge. Maybe think of a castle or a palace or just one of those big houses you find around uh, London where they've got a whole sort of team of people who work there to look after the house and look after the people uh, who live there. And Jesus uses a picture like that. And this man, he, he, he goes away 
and he, he gives his servants the instructions. He doesn't know um, when exactly he's coming, so they've got to be ready at every and any point for his return. And what that means, we've got a hotel manager in the uh, congregation today, and he could tell you in much more detail than I can. What it means is that everyone needs to do their jobs all the time and if everyone does their jobs all the time, then they're ready at all times for VIP visitors in the picture, for this man to come back day or night. And that's how we are to be ready for Jesus' return. By doing what he's called you to do, what he's called me to do, what he's given us gifts for do, by doing those things, day in, day out, faithfully. The urgent instruction to watch isn't the um, sort of the warning of a friend, um, like if you're slacking at work, and watch out, the boss might come keep a look over your shoulder. It, it, it's not the kind of watch of um, you're doing the wrong thing, so you, you set someone up to, to look out and uh, don't get caught. No, neither of those are uh, what Jesus means by watch. That's not the kind of psychology he wants in you or in me in his church. We're not those who are saying, Jesus is coming, oh, look busy, or Jesus is coming, don't get caught. No, it, it's Jesus is coming, get involved. Jesus is coming, get your head in the game. Tune into reality. Jesus is coming. That's the future for you, for me, for planet Earth. So get involved in his people. Get involved in his kingdom, as well as living life in the world. The end of uh, 2 Timothy, the letter Paul writes there, he has this really fascinating phrase, really striking phrase. He talks about Christians as those who and this translation has, and I'm giving you both because I like both, but this translation is, Christians are those who long for his appearing. Isn't that great? That actually a keen Christian is thinking about Jesus coming at the end and longing for that day. Actually, the original is even stronger. It's more powerful. Christians are those who love his appearing. That actually it's not just, oh yeah, I'm, yeah it's in my head. It's, it's all of me. It's, oh yeah, heart and soul. I am looking forward to seeing Jesus. What a great description of someone who understands, someone who's ready, someone who's watching. What does it look like on the average day? Well, again, back to the picture of the house, of the um, really well-functioning hotel, if you like. What does it look like? It means everyone just being involved, being a loyal and efficient team, working together to do whatever your part is, whatever my part is, doing it together. And as we do that, we're constantly ready, week in, week out, whenever the master returns. So, a reflection question, a good reflection question might be, what gifts has Jesus given you that's given, Jesus given me, what gifts has he given you? Not only to use out in the world to earn a living, but also to use around his house. To use in some way relating to his kingdom. Whether that's his people, his church, or some mission that he's put in your heart to, 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 to make him known in the world. What gifts has Jesus given you so that you can be involved in his kingdom, ready for his return? Is that a question you've, you've asked? Is it a question you've asked recently? A moment, as we reflect on that, what gifts has Jesus given you to be involved in his kingdom? Sure, he's given you those gifts to, you know, benefit your friends and family and your networks and to earn a living. But he's also given you gifts, each one of us, 
so that we can get involved in his people and in his mission. And we all need that. We all need team around us because it's not going to be easy between now and when Jesus returns, whenever that is. Verse 12, there will be pushback and persecution, even sometimes from our nearest and dearest. Verse 21, there will be false messengers, offshoots from the church like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons or other religions claiming that they have the answer. And inside the church and on YouTube and the God channel targeting a Christian audience, there will be people who have a different vision of Jesus, a different vision of following him. Jesus tells us about all those things in advance so that none of, us will dis- none of those things will distract us from living for him, for having that future focus. We want to be ready for Jesus' coming, day or night, and we will be as we actively serve him as part of team church, if you like that phrasing. And we also want to be ready and involved and focused and have our head in the game as we tell others about his coming, don't we? People, people we love, they need to hear the warning that just like the people did who weren't loyal to King Richard in the Robin Hood story, well, in the true story of everything, there are many who are not loyal to King Jesus, who, nice people, but they just don't think any of this is true. And we desperately need to help them to re-engage, to revisit, to look again at the Bible, to discover who Jesus really is and why he's so good to know him in our lives. And and even more so, in a war-torn world which doesn't have answers, they're naturally to point to the one who one day will make everything right. Isn't that good news? And the reason I picked up this card, uh, there are many at the back, and we'll talk about them later, is that uh, this, this time of year, two weeks' time, is the easiest opportunity to invite someone to join you for church. Because culturally still, in a slightly kind of um, um, hangover from the past but lovely way, culturally still, a carol service is the easiest uh, opportunity to say to someone, come, come and join me, come and hear some more. In a war-torn world facing so many unknowns, we have great news. Jesus is coming. And so, be ready. Be ready for his return, whether it's by day or by night, whenever it is, together, let's be ready for him.